to the Waldron family for ministering to us this evening uh, with the gifts that God has given you. We are grateful for that. I want to speak this evening just briefly about gifts and uh, maybe a little perspective on Christmas and Christmas gifts. If, uh, if you would please take a Bible, there are the black books that are in the pews around you if you didn't bring one with you, and open it up right to the middle to Psalm and find chapter 112. So just open up toward the center and you should find Psalms or Proverbs and we'll look at the individual Psalm uh, 112 this evening. And uh, I would just like to first wish everyone a Merry Christmas and uh, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Those aren't two words put together, but we trust that you really will be merry this Christmas. Not merry as the world thinks, where you don't have uh, self-control or anything like that, but where there's literally joy in your heart. And there's really only one way for that. Would it be all right if I go ahead and turn the lights on just for a minute? It's a little dark here. Uh, turn on this light for just a second. I, I hate to ruin your Christmas, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we'll turn them back off later. How's that? I know it's a nicer atmosphere when you can't see me. But uh, I have to be able to see uh, my Bible. And so, Let there be light. What's that? Let there be light. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, but I, I do want you to realize that there's nothing, there is nothing about this season when we celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ that gives us a cause to not have joy in us joy in our hearts and if there is a lack of that in your life uh, let me just say that there is joy for everyone through Jesus Christ I will just uh, I, I and I, I want to just s explain to you very very briefly why Jesus why Jesus came to earth you know we all enjoy a nativity do we not a nice looking nativity scene we're driving through a North Bay Village on our way to church in Miami Beach They've got a really nice, the city has one of those really, really nice nativity scenes. And I have looked at those in Christmas stores. They're ridiculously expensive, aren't they? So when I see one, having priced them before, uh, I, I have, an, I guess, more of an appreciation because of how nice they are. A lot of people see a nativity, that is, you know, you usually have a Mary and a Joseph, and a lot of times you see, you know, kind of traveling to the nativity, even though uh, the, the wise men came at a time that Jesus was actually in a home instead of a manger. But you see, you know, three uh, Eastern-looking fellows on camels riding toward the nativity. And then you see, uh, you know, of course, Mary and Joseph and a baby in a manger, and sometimes an angel, and then every good nativity has a sheep somewhere around, and then some shepherd, shepherds, you know, coming in. So you have this nativity scene, and it's, you know, I guess it's pastoral. You know, it's, it, it's, it's relaxing. It's beautiful to see. And I like them. I enjoy them. And I'm not so concerned about having a correct nativity as just a nativity. Those are great. Uh, I fear, however, that sometimes we are more touched by how cute the baby is or how sweet we think. By the way, babies aren't usually sweet in my experience but I know people say what a, I've probably said what a sweet baby when they're behaving sweetly but usually babies are ah, 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 you know then it just that doesn't give me the sweet mood so much <laughs> as uh, <laughs> but a lot of people all oh, the baby you know and then there's a little bit of a connection of uh, Jesus is a baby and to be quite frank with you that absolutely misses the point of Christmas. It isn't about the cuteness or the sweetness, humanly speaking. It is really about the love of God, and not humanly speaking, but God speaking by giving us His Son. It's a gift. Anyone who knows who God is knows that there are some things that separate God from us, that make God very different from us. Now, I'm thankful that because of Jesus, I have a relationship with God that's an actual friendship. I have the experience of being able to just pray to God without having to go through a process, without having to point out every time the my unworthiness. 
But the reality of it is, is that God first is eternal. And that makes Him very different than us. I don't know if it's occurred to you yet, but life is fleeting. It's fast. We do not know how many days we have, and we do not know how long we will be able to live out our days. Life is fleeting. God is eternal. It's a big difference. We have a number of days... We don't know what that number of days is. God has given them to us. But God never began, and God has no ending. He's eternal. That makes Him very different than us, does it not? God made us. He created us. We were created. There's a big difference between being created and being creator, is there not? It's a big difference. Massive difference. <coughs> God has never done evil. God has never sinned. We in our nature are sinners. I don't say that this evening to be judgmental nor offensive. I'm just being honest. I know me, and I don't have to know you. You're not an exception. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin is against God. Each of these characteristics makes God separated from us. Does it not? God's eternality means that as much as you can acquire by way of knowledge in a lifetime, God has never been limited to. You ever realize you, you don't have enough time to even learn everything? It's just not enough time to even learn everything. And yet God is all-knowing and he's not limited by time to learn if God were to learn. Do you see the distinction? God knows everything. We know only what we can learn in the time we have. We're so different from God. But when man sinned, he brought a curse, and it was passed through the seed of man. Of course, every child who was born the son of a man is a sinner. And Jesus Christ was born of the seed of a woman, a virgin birth. And He was God's Son. And so He was not a spectacular baby or an extra cute person. He was God in the flesh. From the, time, from the moment man first sinned, God had promised from the seed of a woman that one would come who would bruise the serpent's head, that is, the sin, would take care of sin once for all. And anyone who had desired to know God had looked toward that promise and believed that promise. The birth of Jesus Christ is so precious and so special because God's promise that He would take care of our sin that separates us from Him and makes us deserving of His judgment was realized the moment Jesus came. My friend, that's very personal because Jesus came for me. Without Jesus, I'm God's enemy. Without Jesus, I'm deserving of God's judgment. With Jesus, He took God's wrath, became God's enemy for me, was judged in my place, and gave me His perfect life for my sinful life. When I received Jesus as my Savior, my friend, the Christmas story got real. It became serious. Friend, this is the time of the year that we celebrate the greatest thing that's ever happened on earth, and that is that God came. That's a gift, isn't it? There are two characteristics I'd like to emphasize about a gift this evening, and that I'd just like to look at uh, an, an extra uh, an extra thing that, that is related this evening. First, the first characteristic of a gift is that it's free. First characteristic of a gift is that a gift is free. Have you ever had the person who is a salesperson sign you up or offer you, call you, you've won the free vacation, the free... How many of y'all 
sign up for the free cars in the mall. Someday I'm going to win the free car in the mall. Okay, so what happens when you're at Bass Pro Shops, for instance, and you sign up for the free vacation? Or you're in the mall and you sign up for the free car? You're always a winner, right? They call you and say, you won! Now, if I could just have your credit card number, then we'll make sure that you get your gift. You ever seen the advertisement on TV where this is yours free for just three small payments of $19.95? Or free, you know, we're going to send you a pencil and uh, for free if you only pay shipping for $19.95? Or something like that. A gift, free. Guys, a gift is free, isn't it? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Jesus, my friend, is God's gift. We'll see that in a minute. Let me go, go to our text briefly. And by the way, I'll be, I'm only going to take a couple uh, more minutes and we'll be, we'll be finished. I, uh, and so look in Psalm 112 first of all. This is David speaking of God and His character. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in His commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Okay, so... We've begun looking at the upright. It means a righteous person. Verse 6, a good man. Would you like to classify yourself and using the word man to represent mankind, would you like to represent yourself as a good man or a good woman, a good representation of mankind? Let's look at the characteristics. A good man showeth favor and lendeth, he will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. Now we know that the Bible says there is none good, there is none righteous. Do we not? How can a person be a good man or be righteous? Only because a perfect man died for the unrighteous and only because God gave us the status or the standing of the righteous one in exchange for our sin. And that is where a person as righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. <coughs> Verse 7, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. <coughs> Verse 8, His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. Verse 9, He hath dispersed, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness endureth forever, his horn shall be exalted with honor. Now verse 9 is where I would like to focus this evening. And I want to just ask the question, do you have a problem with giving gifts? Particularly at Christmas. I don't know about you, but the commercialization of Christmas is annoying and always has been, isn't it? In other words, the fact that people who don't care about Christmas, don't care about Jesus, and don't care about the people that celebrate Christ's birth, want to sell things to people who do because they'll buy them. Sort of like 4th of July selling flags made in China. You know what I mean? The first time I ever saw an Amer a U.S. flag, now I don't know if you can get a flag that's made in the United States, but I remember the first time seeing a man selling flags on a street corner, and I examined the flag, I was going to buy one, and I saw Made in China, sticker on it. Made in China for a United States flag. Julio's that a problem? I don't want one of those, do you? Yeah, we got a couple, this is the Marine Row right here. And these guys say, flags made in China? No way. No way. Uh-uh. No, sir. Okay, so um, in the same way, I feel that people who 
don't care about Jesus, or even are against Jesus, who want to make a profit over the celebration of Jesus, we're really not on the same page. Right? Okay. Doesn't I don't lose sleep over it. I'm not bothered by it. I just don't want to buy their stuff. Okay, that's how I feel about it. People that don't love Jesus, people that don't love me, that want to make money because I love Jesus, I'm not so into it. But what about the concept of gift giving? I hear Christians talk about, you know, Christmas is a time that we should worship. And, uh, you know, this whole idea of giving gifts. I don't know about it. By the way, kids, we are against giving gifts on Christmas, just so you know. Anybody who's... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. I don't know about this idea of why do people exchange gifts on Christmas? Now, I'm not going to tell you there's a deep-rooted spiritual truth behind it, but there is a concept about gift giving that reflects that God is a gift giver and He's affected change for the same in our lives. First thing about a gift is that it's free. It's not a gift if you have to pay for it, right? Second thing about a gift is that it doesn't do you any good unless you receive it. Now many individuals would say, you know, I'm fine with Jesus being God's Son coming to earth dying for my sins and I think that's beautiful but I don't think God should make that the only way for me to have eternal life that may be valid certainly for some but I should not have to go that road or that way in order to receive God's gift, or in order to satisfy God's wrath. The only thing I can say to you, there's a lot of things I could say, but the only thing that I think is worth saying to that is that that notion makes a mockery of the sacrifice of the cross. In other words, if a sacrifice was not necessary for sin. Jesus did not need to die. And could I put it in words that are blunt? God's silly to have sent him for such a purpose. If Jesus was not the only way, if a sacrifice was not necessary for sin to be paid, Jesus did not need to die. And God was silly to send His Son to die for our sin. And I hope that puts it in perspective because God isn't silly, is He? And if there were another way, what a waste. Do you know it's disrespectful for us to think along the terms of there could be another way If there were another way, do you think God might have known? Would God possess the intellect if there were another way for us to be redeemed to Him? <clears throat> Isn't that obvious? Jesus is the only way. Because sin has to be paid for or God wouldn't be a good God. Okay. I want to say that a good gift, a gift needs to be received. And so, if Jesus died for your sin, and God doesn't force people to go to heaven, then the gift is really a free opportunity, isn't it? In other words, you can receive Him. Scripture puts it this way, as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. You can become God's child by receiving the gift. I did it when I was a child. I understood I was a sinner. I understood Jesus died for my sin. And I simply prayed and said, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want to be saved because of what Jesus did. And God saved me and His Spirit came in me. And my friend, He's never left and it's real. Jesus is the means 
for eternal life. And because I'm saved, Christmas is different for me than it is for the people hawking wares next door, than it is for people trying to make a profit or just trying to be happy in this season of the year. It's different for me because I understand what God did for me. I realize that I'm loved. When we were yet without sin or, sin, or without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. God loved me. But God commendeth His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm loved. You're loved. A lot of people this time of the year do not know that they are loved. My friend, the most important person in the world loves you. God loves you. And Jesus Christ coming as a gift to us is a presentation of God's love. Verse 9 of chapter 112 in Psalm. The Bible says, He hath dispersed, he hath given to the poor. Speaking of a person who is, who is his righteousness is an everlasting remembrance. And then it says, His righteousness endureth forever. I want to go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 where this passage of Scripture is actually quoted. If you could turn there quickly, that's fine. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is actually talking about saints giving for the well-being of other saints. In other words, charitable giving, giving like what we do for the ministry. And that's what it is in verse 1 for us, touching the ministering to the saints. Paul begins to tell the church at Corinth about giving. I want to look at a couple of verses. The Bible says in verse 12, and Paul's talked about sowing sparingly, reaping sparingly, sowing bountifully, reaping bountifully, being a giver. Verse 9, I should say, as it is written, He hath dispersed abroad. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. Have you ever seen that before? That's Psalm 112, verse 9. As it is written. Where is it written? In Psalm. His righteousness remaineth forever. Now verse 10, the Bible says, Now he that ministereth to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. And again, that's part of that quotation, the next verse in Psalm 112. I want to go down to verse 15. I want to look at a verse that's oftentimes used in the context of Christmas or Christmas plays. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Now I know I've taken not very much time to go from point A to Z, if you will, here. But this passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians is actually explaining to a church the example of giving. And the ultimate example of giving is God who gave us a gift that is described as unspeakable. Now why is it described as unspeakable? Because we can't speak about what God did? No, but because of the love that God gave us when He gave us His Son can't be described. In other words, I can only tell you what God did. I can't tell you how much it means because it means more than I could describe or speak with words. Jesus is God's unspeakable gift. And so here's the answer to the question. Is it okay or is it right for us at Christmas time, in response to what God has done for us, to give. He's the example of giving. So we don't have to buy things to give, or we don't necessarily have to uh, give typical things. But giving at Christmas time is just a reflection of something that can't even be spoken by description <coughs> because God has given so much. And I think it's a beautiful thing to reflect giving, isn't it? 
and is perfectly appropriate, and I hope you know that's the answer. God, thank you for your unspeakable gift, Jesus. Thank you for the time that we have had the opportunity to be ministered to this evening by the song, by the music, by, God, the prayer, by the speaking and preaching of your word. And I pray that it would impact our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. We have a couple of things over here uh, for refreshments. And so we'd like to serve those up. Don't step on the violins. Let us uh, get those out of the way first. But hang around in fellowship. Thank you for being here tonight. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.